My name is Brent Wood. I own a title agency called Omni Title Southwest Florida. Uh, we're here local. I have an office that's a mile away from this building off of Colonial and DeLeon. We also have an office uh, out in Cape Coral at 1222 Southeast 47th Street, which is kind of by the deck. Um, <clears throat> but I also like to tell everybody, I send mobile notaries for free and every single one of my staff members is a notary. So if there's something out in Lehigh, Port Charlotte, uh, Naples, Bonita, don't let distance of my office affect the type of service you provide because I'll either go do the signing, my wife will, or somebody, or we'll send a notary for free. I don't, I don't want to lose a closing over $150 notary fee. So I usually cover that out of pocket, um, you know, for, for out of Lee County closings. Um, I'm going to go through some slides today about some legal aspects of real estate investments. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a licensed attorney. Uh, but my attorney who's going to be doing a class uh, with me here next week, him and I uh, work together to put this presentation together. Um, I also have a printout for you guys at home, which Joanna can send you as a PDF, and it talks about the six common ways to take title in Florida, what we see most frequently, um, what that means for your buyers, um, and also how you can help prepare them when going into a contract on what is going to be the most beneficial way for them, their wife, their business, whatever it may be to take title, uh, especially if something were to happen to them so that we can avoid probate and all that jazz um, uh, for their, their heirs who would be receiving the property after they pass. Uh, so with that being said, um, I'll just jump right into the slides. I'll try to look at the camera and the people here at the same time. Um, I'm not really good on camera, so I'll, I'll do the best I can. So um, just to notice, this, these slides are just general information. <clears throat> um, if you have a specific contract you're under or anything like that, just reach out to me outside of this class. I can put you in contact with my attorney, Daniel Ohm, or I can usually work through a lot of the issues that you may see because uh, we've seen, I think we've done over 400 closings in the last year. So I've seen things from $1,000 land and lot deals to a $10 million six pharmacy commercial deal. We currently have a commercial deal right now, which is 93 separate parcels. Um, so we can handle everything from A to Z. We do in-house FERPTA. My VP and the, uh, Megan Johnson, who runs my Cape Coral office, is FERPTA certified through the state um, and all that. So we do that in-house for a lot less than a company like FERPTA Solutions would do. We do 1031 exchanges. And then obviously we love our bread and butter, $400,000, three, two with a pool uh, that we do on a daily basis. So with that, um, we'll just hop right into it. So first one here, why hire a closing agent or attorney to handle your real estate deals? And I like this one, um, you know, a lot of people with their FISBOs think that they can, they can do real estate uh, on their own because they, they don't want to pay commissions or closing fees or whatever it may be. But I always try to remind people that, you know, what we do is a trade. This is a very interesting industry. And I always remind any consumers that they need to talk to you guys as realtors about um, having them represent you because I've seen things blow up because they didn't have somebody that knew what they were doing and you can get yourself into some some major trouble financially or legally if you don't have somebody that uh, has gone through the, the appropriate classes and know what's going on so um, the support that that me an attorney or a realtor would uh, provide everybody is uh, reviewing, reviewing the contract that's very very key um, I love the go <clears throat> for any new agents out there. I would love to sit down with you at lunch or, or a coffee or something and go through the contract um, basically line by line because I, I can't tell you how many times <clears throat> a buyer or seller calls me and they're upset about having to see that they had to pay something on the closing statement or something like that. And, and I have to point out the section in the contract which stipulates the exact terms that that we're moving forward with. I think that especially in the last year and a half, people are, are so rushed and they're trying to move so quickly that they don't take time to read it or, or somebody doesn't explain it to them. And when that happens, um, 
uh, you know, I don't want to say we can hurt people's feelings, but it gives a bad taste in their mouth, even though, because they don't do the due diligence to really read what they're signing. They don't understand what they're signing. So it's very important to have somebody sit down and talk uh, through those situations with them. And any of you agents that want to see me outside of this class and go through a contract, I'm 100% open to it. Um, any of you that want to sit in a buyer signing with a 150 page loan package and just hear how we explain this stuff, I have no problem with that. Like my number one focus as a title agency is to educate my realtors as best as I can. Number one, because it's going to make you a better agent, but number two, so that you, that you don't have a buyer or seller write a bad review because they feel you didn't explain something to them. So I, I, I'm very keen on educating you guys, working with you guys and doing everything I can to make you grow, not only to sell more deals, but to learn more about exactly what happens in every single transaction from my side of things. Because I, I get to see um, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, negotiation support, obviously that's, that's an easy one for us to know why we need somebody to, to work with us. Um, negotiation, uh, checking title, that's my job. Preparing and attending closing, um, I think that that's my opinion is that all of us work together so that when we have buyers and sellers in the closing room, they don't feel like they're abandoned um, when they when they have their closing documents in front of them. And I know you guys are extremely busy and I know it's hard to come to closings, but my advice sometimes if you have a new seller or a new buyer, if you can't make it to the closing, at least let me know so I can walk them through what's going to happen before they're in the hot seat and before they're starting to sign hundred pages of a 30 year mortgage that they don't understand uh, what they're signing. Um, and then tax and estate planning. Uh, that's a part of real estate investments. Um, I'm not a certified accountant, but I do know some of the language and we'll go over some of it on how uh, any of your clients who are investors can protect themselves. Um, 1031 exchanges, all that fun stuff. Um, so our next one here, this one's just saying, you know, hire your title agent or your attorney before before you sign the contract. And I like that line, the law no normally will not protect you from making a bad deal. And that's why it's extremely important that we disclose, 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 and explain, explain, explain exactly what's going on. <clears throat> so we all know that um, just a regular as is contract, you know, the, the same fill in the blanks are gonna be there on every single one. And that's great, Real, realtors can help fill in the blanks, but modifying or drafting additional clauses is like taking a scalpel to the contract. Um, and for that, you want a surgeon. So um, when the, the right, yeah. yeah. So when the deal is, um, is a little unique and not just like the regular three, two pool home that I was talking about, <clears throat> before we start making those revisions to the contract or those very specific uh, stipulations, it's, it's very, very smart to either give me a call or give my attorney a call so that we can make sure they're worded properly and we can make sure that both parties agree and, and they're not signing something that a week later they're going to they're gonna say that they didn't fully understand that concept and they don't want to move forward with that. Um, just as a disclaimer, <clears throat> my attorney that I work with, you guys are going to meet him next week. His name's Daniel Ohm. I pay him um, a retainer every single month, and he will work with you guys uh, on behalf of me to get you through whatever you're going through uh, free of charge um, about 99% of the time. Um, he does probate in two or three weeks. He's, he's really, really good. And I like providing that to you and your buyers and your sellers just in case you need anything from him. So kind of related to the top one, clauses drafted by non-closing professionals can cause, and you see the issues right here. And those are the ones that we, that we do not want to have to deal with after the fact. Because <clears throat> when we go under contract for, for, for a property, our main concern is how can we get to the closing table as quickly and efficiently as possible? And at any time that, you're, that we're drafting things um, that, that quite possibly could have been written incorrectly, that's going to cause delays. And we want to avoid delays at all costs because, <clears throat> number one, the market's crazy still, and we want to get houses um, on the market sold and closed. But number two, we don't want to risk the buyer's uh, you know, rate lock or, or 
you know, the prorations would change. We just, we want to avoid any of that mess from the time we're under contract to the time we're sitting down and signing. Um, this one's pretty easy, disputes over interpretation of the contract and cause litigation. That's the last thing that we want to deal with. Nobody wants to go through that. The buyers, the sellers, um, it's just, it, it can turn into a really big mess and a lot of financial problem and headache for everybody. So it's just so key that it's, that it's very black and white, very cut and dry before we go under contract, before we sign any addendums. And I have a couple examples that I've seen in the last month that I, you know, I just want to talk to you guys about. And one of them, I don't know how we're going to move forward with it, but it's interesting. I think you guys will find it interesting as well. Um, and then obviously the last one, litigation. Last thing we ever want to happen. It does happen from time to time, but but it causes delays, headaches, and the expenses, you know, can can keep can keep going up. <clears throat> Contingencies. So clean title. You know, and it says how clean is title. So just a quick, what I do, when we get a property, I send out for a title commitment for my underwriter. My underwriter sends me a title commitment back with requirements of issues that I have to resolve before I can provide the buyer a free and clean title, which obviously it's a requirement. No buyer is going to buy a property that has a bunch of uh, clouds on the title. So there's a couple things that we go through. The title commitment, obviously you guys know what that is. You've heard of that municipal lien searches that covers utilities, um, you know, Cape Coral, uh, city things. <clears throat> um, what else? That's about it for the lien searches. But then we also check into permits and code enforcement. But a fun fact is, if there's an open permit on the property, that is not actually a title defect. So a lot of times what our agency will do if there's an open permit is we'll explain to the buyer, it has nothing to do with providing them a free and clear title. Let's go ahead and get this thing closed the day that we want to close it. And then after the fact, my office will work with that buyer to get that permit closed out. Nine out of 10 times, what will happen is you'll have a uh, roofer or plumber, whoever came out and did work on the property will complete the work. You've paid them. The contractor is happy, he's paid, he moves on, and he doesn't want to take the time to go back to the city and close that permit out because he's already gotten paid and he's moving on to the next job. I don't mean that to sound harsh, but I see it on a weekly basis. But remember, like I said, if you have a buyer and there's open permits, that's not a title issue. We can still uh, provide free and clear title, and we just help them after the fact to go ahead and get the permit uh, closed out, yes. How have you guys been affected as Mm. Deals, you seeing issues yeah, so that, yeah, what she's talking about is like how far behind the city is in getting to these permits. And Lee County is pretty far behind too. But what the main thing, I, <laughs> yeah, like, so if I see an open permit, I already know that, okay, we're not going to get this closed in two weeks or three weeks when our closing date is like, like very rarely. I try to send the girls in that apartment edible arrangements to kind of hook us up from time to time. That's a fact. Um, I do do that with some people, but um, you know, that's when we sit down with the buyer. I'll call you guys immediately and say, hey, there's an open permit. They added a bathroom or whatever it is. I've already talked to the contractor. The work is done. They've paid them. Let's go ahead and move forward with closing. And then after the fact, we'll get that permit closed out because the, you know, the open permit is not going to it's not going to cause any problems for that buyer in regards to like liens or anything like that. They just want to make sure that the work has been completed and we move forward. But an open permit versus like a contractor's lien are two different things. A contractor's lien is when a roofer put a roof on a property and let's say that there's still $2,000 owed on the roof. In the roofer, well, a lot of times what I'll see is the roofer saying, well, I'm not going to go out there and finish the job until he pays me the 2000 And the seller saying, well, I'm not going to pay the 2000 until he comes out and does it. That's completely different. Those type of things uh, are on the title commitment, and they are requirements to be closed out via a notice of commencement, uh, which is both parties agreeing that the work has been completed, they've been paid in full, and then they release that lien that they put on there. So those are two completely separate things. One is serious, the notice of commencement is serious, we cannot provide free title or clean title until it's that, that lien's taken out. A permit is just the city making sure that the work was done 
according to their standards to get it done. Um, appraisals, you guys know about this. We deal with this um, on a daily basis. Yes. Okay, so that's a great question. So the standards that I have in my office is this. When we receive a new contract, I require our team to send out for all services on the same day, send out all welcome emails on the same day, including wiring instructions. I get my commitment back in about three to five days, business days. When I get that commitment back, my processor immediately looks at it. We read through, you know, typically there's two to three things that we need to clear on there. The first one being an outstanding mortgage on the property already. We order a payoff and we move forward. Um, I have a rule that my title commitments per my processor have to be completely cleared within seven to 10 business days. So my office is ready to close within 10 days uh, on about any file. Yeah, after, you file. after we receive the, the, the contract. The contract. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'll be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. Open. yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, so we're ready in 10 days, but there's times like, and I find this on more lot and land deals, you'll have a land deal where somebody passed away and the, ch and the children now see like, oh, I didn't even know dad owned this land. Um, we wanna sell it because we live in Massachusetts. We're never gonna build in Lehigh. Some commitments will come back and there'll be like 25 requirements before I can get it clear. Mowing liens, um, you know, um, in the city, like if you own a piece of land and, the, and your neighbors are calling complaining about how the grass is, the city comes out there and mows it and they charge you every single time. The most I've ever seen is $12,000 in mowing liens. But the problem, yeah, more than the, yeah, yeah. But the problem with that is what happened was a woman who had a, had a lot with all those liens, as soon as the city caught wind that she was selling her primary residence and was going to make money on it, they immediately attached that lien onto her primary. So to answer the question about how long, 90% of the time, like I said, we're done in 10 days. Cash deals, we could close in probably seven days. But it just depends on how many requirements, how clean that property is. And that's why I say 90% of the time, they're, all, they're almost the same every time. There's a mortgage on the property. You know, maybe somebody passed away. We need to show them uh, the death certificate and we're good to go. But there are, there are occasions where the, the property was bought, let's say on a tax deed sale. And there's just 30 things that we got to clean up before we can sell. We can, we can close on it. Um, but I, 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 if anyone wants to see what an actual title commitment looks like and you want me just to explain it, I have no problem doing that. We can do it on a Zoom or on the phone or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Does Omni Title provide a checklist of protocol to the realtor and the About like what we need to move forward? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, an official checklist? No. What I do is, uh, as soon as we send the welcome emails, I'll send buyer with wiring, seller, uh, their, their information sheet. I put both agents on the same email and I lay out everything that's going to happen from the jump. I ask for broker fees, commission splits. Is there anything unique about your buyer or seller that we should be aware of, like mail away, whatever it is? Um, every single week, we'll provide an official update, um, but like a real checklist. It, it would kind of, it would be a little hard because each one is different. Sure. Um, but we're very good with keeping everybody in the loop. Um, one thing that I'm keen on is anytime there is a serious issue on that commitment, I'm very transparent. I let everyone know immediately. I say, here's what's here's what this is. Um, here's how we're going to fix it, and this is how, how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. But those are one off. One and maybe fifty are really bad. All the rest are like the three, two with the pool. Somebody's just selling it, paying off their mortgage and moving forward. Uh, but a checklist is a good idea. Um, we just, my main thing is I, I just need the buyer information, who's taking title, the address, the address to appear on the deed and the lender contact information if they have a loan, the sellers, I just need their social address to appear on the deed and any payoffs that we're gonna do. Once we get those things back, we're, we're basically, we, in my opinion, we're basically done. So, but you do the updates? 
absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. we we don't leave anybody in the dark. Um, for me, like, I know, you know, everybody always wants to close as soon as possible. And I get that. And I, we try to accommodate that as best we can, because to be honest, I, I want to close too. You know, if we're ready to go in two weeks, but the contract said, you know, is still three weeks out. If we can go and do it, we'll go, we'll get it done. You know, um, the buyer's lender is going to be the one that, that is, is um, hold, not holding things up, but they have a lot more requirements. Exactly. People are like, are you ready to close? I'm like, I was ready to close a week ago. I'm just waiting for the lender to be clear to close. We can move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I've worked for other title companies before I opened my own. I saw what worked with them and what didn't work with them. Um, and I always explain that um, we should never have somebody calling us asking what's going on. By that point, that person is usually frustrated. We need to be able to get ahead of that every time and say, hey, we got our commitment back. We send it out to the agents because we're required to. Um, and then they, they can call and say, hey, what's what's up with this? Or, you know, I see something on the commitment. Most of them don't. Um, but we're very good at, at keeping everybody in the loop as, as much as possible because I don't like taking phone calls with people upset. So I, I want to try. <laughs> I mean, I want to try to make sure that we're that we're moving forward and Crystal's close some deals with us. She can attest to what we try to do. And, um, yeah, you guys can keep us in the loop of what's going on and how things are at. I yeah. I like that you asked all those questions on the content so that at the end, it's not this scramble of, Correct. oh, I didn't know your buyer was in town. It's like, well, I told somebody, how come yeah. everybody's not communicating and you guys do all communicate with each other? Yeah. Like if I told one person, everybody seems to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's very helpful. Um, that I'm not like really telling everybody the same story. Mm -hmm. You know, that person doesn't live here. You need to mail out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and with for like the agents, like I said, we lay out <laughs> the seven questions that we need immediately from the beginning. Because I know you guys are busy. So if you can if you can tell me everything that you have going on in one email, you won't hear from me again unless there's a problem or we're about to close. Um, and that's in regards to commission splits. Does your broker have a DA? Um, do you want to check or a wire for your commission? Where do I mail it? You know, and we get all that information right from the beginning. We put it in our file. Everyone on my team knows exactly what's going on. And then we, we clear the commitment and move forward. Um, all right, so financing. <laughs> uh, what I want to talk to you guys about is this, what happens when the loan falls through. If you see on your contract where it talks about financing, if one, if this, this is just from what I read because I'm dealing with this situation. Um, property went under contract. Buyer pr provided a letter from the lender saying that they were approved for a certain amount. Week later, they said the, the, the buyer's agent sent in a, a release and cancellation and the listing is like, what are you talking about? He said, oh, the financing fell through. She's like, well, how did it fall through? We had a pre-approval letter. That's the only reason why we went under contract with you because you had already said you were approved. So I, so the listing agent calls me and she's like, you know, what do we do? Because my buyers are not going to release this because they've already said that they got, they were approved for the financing. So I'm like, that's a good question. So on next time you look at the contract, there's a, there's wording that looks exactly like this. And it has to do with the buyer's financing. And it said the buyer, the buyer has to do due diligence and act in good faith to obtain another source of financing. So the way that I interpret that, and I'm not saying that this is a law or a statute, but if one lender falls through, I think diligence and good faith would be to reach out to two other ones to see if they'll, they'll approve. You know, and I think that because the earnest money on this one is 15,000. So the sellers, yeah, the sellers claim is, well, we should have it because they told us they were approved a week later. How did they go from approved to 50000 more than the purchase price to not approved a week later? Yes. Because you can't call the lender on the other side. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just. Right. But, but, and I'm with you. And that's my, was my first thought. But then I'm like, if I was the buyer, this is what I'm just saying for you guys that have buyers. If you want to fight for that 15,000, I think the smart route would be to try two other things of financing 
If you get denied on both of those, then you go to the sellers in the listing and say, look, we tried three ways. We got denied every single time. We did diligence and we get in good faith. We tried our hardest to get to get approved by somebody and we couldn't get approved. I think that's an easier. Mm -hmm. Going back to the break, our, our new contract kind of addresses that a little bit too. The new one actually says buyer seller agreement. So it's like the buyer is the Yes. And it specifically states what they mean by good faith. Because people are like, well, they, they tried. That was their good faith. Correct. Now they're yeah. spelling out exactly the tasks they had to accomplish in order for it to be good faith. Yes. And I love that because. So I said to be in writing, and I like that too. Can't yeah. Just a text message or a call. Yep. Because when I talked to Daniel about this exact case, and I'm glad that we brought it up here. I read that not I don't I don't know if it was that one the old one and his response to me was good luck good luck proving good faith and diligence right. from the seller side proving that they were not right. acting in good faith and diligence so I love that they really explained that out now um, because I, I don't know if they're allowed to do this but if a lender approves you and then you want to back out of the deal could you just tell that lender to send you a denial letter gotcha okay Gotcha. Now I assume that that means everyone has ethics and they're not going to lie. To yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going out under, under the rain. Yeah, I'm going to go out of the window. I've got to go with that. Yeah. And situation two months ago, the buyer that got cold feet, they decided they didn't want it, but they, they thought that it was just suddenly, they were like, this is too much, we can't afford it. So the lender was like, well, yeah, you can, like, according to all of our mm -hmm. stuff, like, you're approved, everything was golden, but they were like, they didn't want it anymore. And they were begging their lender, like, please give us a denial so we can get out of this. And they were like, no. No. Absolutely yeah. not. Most will say no. Yeah. But yeah. 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 And that's good if they do. This one happened to be Rocket Mortgage, so I don't trust them as much oh. as I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, because I I called the lender too, to, and he was he was not a happy camper that I was calling him. But you know, I just I feel like that this is a great example to bring up. So when you have buyers, I don't know if you want to disclose like from the beginning, like, look, we have a lender, you're approved. But if this seller accepts this contract and that lending falls through, I think that it's fair that we try some other options, you know, but that's probably just a case by case. But I'll put it this way. The contract is still sitting in my office and I'm still holding on to the funds. So yeah. I have no idea what way this this one's going to fall. I've actually, as the listing agent, encouraged buyers agent Someone local other than Yep. I, I That's what this I, the listing I agent did, did that. I did yep. It was, it was somebody that I've known for a very long time and she was able to get the job done. Nice. So I mean, they get some messages. Yeah. 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 But it's just something that, you know, this is a very serious contingency through that contract. And, you know, like I was saying, I think disclosing to, to buyers up front, like exactly how the process is going to be, exactly what's going to be needed from them helps because, you know, I won't, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've had deals this past year where the buyers are, are just are clueless of what's going on and, and they're scared, you know, they're not like physically scared, but they're, the anxiety, you know, they just want to know exactly how we can, how we can get it to work. And, you know, we see, ones that go amazing and we see ones that aren't so amazing too but um you know i think this needs to be addressed every time you have a buyer and we're going under same with the lender you know i i know you guys all have preferred lenders so you probably have connections with them already you're probably already asking them like is this going to go through or whatever um uh, and then the last one that i just have on here is just home inspection um and that's just totally a contingency of you. I see a lot now where people are waiving the inspection period because they're trying to win the offer. Um, and I, you guys are just going to, um, you're going to decide what's best for your client in that specific situation on whether or not you're going to waive it. You know, if we're going to ask seller for credits, you know, I've had a lot where the walkthrough has gone south and they want a credit on the same day of closing. Um, you know, so these are just things that need to be brought up long before we're we're at what what happened oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, I've had it where um, I've had two cases in the last six months where they sold the turnkey. The buyer goes in, they've removed the appliances, switched them out. Oh, no. Um, yeah. That's All the bed sheeting. Yeah. So yeah, back in the dark days, I was actually the buyer sitting in the turnkey. Oh, nice. That's them. smart. Because yeah. we, did, we did trust them. That's so, smart. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that that's a great point. Um, the agent that I was working with on that deal, where the buyer came in, um, the bed sheets were all switched out, and it was completely turnkey. They didn't do an inventory list when they went in the first time. Yeah. So that was very hard to prove um, what was there and what was not because it wasn't like like huge things like this is noticeable, but bed sheets, towels, um, little end tables, and the seller saying, well, show me a list where you checked off all the stuff. And that one ended up falling through 700,000 over some bed sheets. Um, yes, yeah, in uh, Treviso you Bay. You never know what's gonna tick the, the box for people. Yeah. Well, you get there. yeah, because then the buyer immediately pride said it set in he's like well at the, i don't even want to deal with these i don't want them to make a dime anymore they did this yeah. you know and then you know guys know how it goes and i'm sitting here just yeah 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 and to Oh, people removing trees? Oh, you're kidding. No, it's a big deal. It's come around <laughs> closer. Yeah, it's come yeah. around closer. What? Well, because you have these burial trees now, like that's grandma. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> or this is our marital tree, and we all of a sudden doing the stand and the unity, you know, saying it's our marriage tree. We're, of course, taking it. So I have to ask. So you have to be fucked because they don't think yeah. anything of it. They think they take it. Right, exactly right. Everything yeah. in your yard is staying. <laughs> Yeah. 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 No, you're not. Yeah. No, it's it's down to that. But until somebody tells you, you don't even think mm -hmm. maybe you'd be asking for a tree in the yard. Yeah, and I can see how you know I could like for me if I was selling a house with bed sheets, I would assume that maybe that buyer didn't want to sleep in the bed sheets that I used to sleep in. So I wouldn't think it's a big deal to, but if the guy's doing an Airbnb and needs to, wants to rent it, it has to go out and buy bed sheets for four bedrooms. It's just, right. it's just, you guys know how it is. You deal with it every single day. And we just, that's why I want to just show like, let's get everything out on the table. This is what we need to work on. This is what everybody agrees on. Let's move forward at, you know, nicely and, and, without pride being hurt. Um, this one, everything's negotiable. You guys know that. Um, common deals, uh, common deal points beyond the fill in the blank and check the box parts of the form contract. You guys know the special terms of them. Um, so here's just some examples. Know what you want and ask for it. So we can, you know, closing costs. I know seller picks in Lee County, completely negotiable. You can do 50-50 splits. You can ask them for 1500 credit toward whatever. Um, assignability. I know that we're going to talk about that next week. And then, you know, repairs. These are just examples of, of some things that we may want and ask for it. But, you know, you, you, you have to ask for it when you're going to execute that contract. There's maybe an addendum. But to avoid that, if we just get it up front and, and ask what's going on and what people need, it's a lot easier in the long run and then know what they want and trade for it. Some sellers may want to close in 10 days. If you use us, we can probably do that. Um, some some of them want to hire EMD now. You know, I'm seeing EMDs that are 20, 25,000 now versus 2,500. Um, you know, they may want no contingencies, no inspection period, no, you know, appraisals, whatever. That's what they want. So if you know that they're coming with that, 
you know, if they want to hire EMD, then you guys can say, okay, that's cool. We'll put a higher EMD, but we want an inspection period and we want to be able to put repairs on whatever, you know, and, and just all these things you guys know already, but it's always a nice reminder to, to um, talk about it immediately up front. Uh, and then whatever, whatever they're asking for, you can run it by somebody and say, hey, does, do you think this makes sense? Uh, do you think this is, you know, either realtor to realtor, realtor to broker? Um, you can ask me about it because I see so many contracts or, or an attorney about it just to make sure. So to your point, or I like your point about making sure everything's negotiated, like as much as we can't beat it in the contract, we can't do anything on trial. You want these deals all you want, but it's not like several years ago where it was we'll just give it a contract during inspection. <laughs> because it's it's not flying. Even if it's something that's totally wrong, they're like, you know what, screw you, we're gonna put it back on the market and we'll still be able to get somebody to take it with the knowledge Correct. of the market. We had a deal this week with one of our agents. Um, they went under contract, they had a short inspection period. Um, and during the inspection period, they came back and said, Hey, we want the whole we want either a credit or we want the whole AC completely replaced. Mm. And the seller said, Well, what's wrong with it? It's like it's broken. And they said, Well, no, it's 20 years old. And they said, well, you, but it's working. Well, yeah, it's 20 years old. You knew that when you wrote the contract. Uh -huh. It's not broken. We're not fixing it. And JJ said, tell them your broker is also older. They were just like, they were under this impression. Oh, the buyers were under this impression of, well, let's just win the bid and get it out of contract and then ask for what we want to ask for. Right. We have them now. Or they were from out of state. Probably. Yeah. I don't know where the buyers were from mm -hmm. our agents' deals, but it was just, it was funny because they just came back asking for all these things and, and they weren't broken. It was just, well, why are you asking for these? Well, they're, well, they're old, but they work. You can't do that in this market. Mm -hmm. So if, if they were worried about the AC being an issue, that should have been something that they put in their mm -hmm. contract, but they weren't going to because we were in a bit for them. Yeah. So. Exactly. I mean, I can see where they're coming from, but that's something that right from the beginning, oh, it's 20 years old. Is there something we can work out to, right, exactly. Yeah. And she works very well. <laughs> um, so this one's, this one's pretty cut and dry, just like I was saying before, checking title, um, identifying, resolving issues. Um, a lot of times there aren't really any ones that we, you know, can't handle, but probate is one that comes up all the time. Um, probate is when the owner of the house passed away and nobody knows who the rightful heir is going to be and nobody knows who can convey title. Um, and some of them, if there's a will, probate can take 10 to 14 days. If there's no will, two to three months. So when you're working with sellers that are elderly or, or, yeah, I guess that would be okay to say. Um, you know, you can talk to them if they have a will, or, or you know, look what the vesting deed is and how they're holding title because they very well may have taken title the wrong way when they purchase it. Nobody ever told them about it. They pass away. The wife thinks, well, it goes right to me, and they say no because what we're going to talk about with how to take title, they can say no because what will happen is, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, but when somebody passes away, and let's say it's half a million dollar house, more than one person is, can come out of the woodwork and say, wait, he told me a year ago that the house was mine. And then another, the cousin comes, no, he told me it was mine. That's what probate is. It goes to a judge. A judge determines exactly who's going to get it, who can convey title, because if I don't know who can legally sign my deed, I can't close it. Because that'd be a title claim. If somebody, if somebody that could not convey the property to somebody else signed the deed, somebody else could come back in that family and say, well, she didn't have the right to sign that deed. I'm going to be the rightful owner. That's when we have a title claim. So my underwriter, that's why my underwriter on, on probates requires us to have a judgment, um, which can be handled very simply if there's a will. Death certificate, show them the will. We're good. We're clean. Let's close. Um, excluding from coverage uh, versus taking legal measures. That's what I was kind of talking about before. Codes, permits, HOA disclosures. Um, the HOA disclosures are, I know you guys, they have three days to, to review them, but 
what I found is I don't think a lot of people are actually really reading into them. And then when I get my estoppel back and explain what all the fees are, they, they kind of act like they, that's like news to them that like Babcock Ranch, for example, has a very, very huge HOA. Um, for a seller with Babcock Ranch, it's going to cost them probably $3,000 in HOA stuff alone to just sell the property. I thought they got rid of the, didn't they have the estoppel? Wasn't that just like 250 per mayor? I mean, I know that there's a mass association. Correct. And then mm -hmm. the other side associations. Yeah. Where but how do they get above that 500 mark? They have um, a capital contribution, which is 0.25% of the sales price okay. that the seller has to pay, and then the buyer transfer fees, any quarterly fees, prorations. I mean, it's super in depth. And unfortunately, I don't know exactly how in depth it's going to be until I get my estoppel. But if you guys have the HOA disclosures, it's going to lay out most of that stuff in that in those those packets or whatever you want to call Some them. Some people don't know their, what their HOA does. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's why. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it, that's a good point. Um, and then uh, under this is just a good example. Understanding what are you getting and what is covered things that are not. So we had one last year where somebody bought a piece of land because they were going to build on it. There was a de deed restriction on the land, so they could not build. A deed restriction is not. Uh, a title issue. That's not on my commitment. That has nothing to do with me providing a free and clear title. So I, the person who bought that land is actually a friend of mine and I felt really bad, uh, but that's due diligence that the buyers need to do um, because I would have, it's like, I don't know. It's not on my commitment. It's not something I have to clear. Um, same with just an example for land is like, are there owls on it? Um, is there an eagle nest close to it or ospreys or whatever? gophers i mean these are serious you know people will buy land site unseen and see there's three turtle nests on there fwc charges like 1500 a turtle per egg to safely remove them so pine island is big you know big with that and those are just things that you know due diligence from the beginning you know i feel like the seller should disclose it something like that but they don't have to you know that there's turtles on the land or whatever it may be I don't know if they've changed it now where they have to, but. Our company tries to use a vacant land seller's disclosure, but a lot of our people are from out of the area. They go outside on payments, hold on for a couple of years, they're turning it around there. They don't want to come around. Yeah. Okay. Send somebody out there. Yeah, like builders do that. They have a, an employee that all they do is go to land and walk it, make sure there's not an eagle nest within 300 feet or something. Yeah. Gophers or turtles, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. But I mean, that's, <laughs> but think about it. You buy, you buy a piece of land for 10,000 that has four turtles on it. You're paying half what you just bought the land to remove the turtles, you know, like yeah. those are in like, you know, somebody from Oregon's not going to know that we have ospreys and turtle nests on vacant land all the time. You know, they, they might not. That's just something if you have buyers that like land, that's something to bring up in the beginning. We're really good about that. Because we have a nice little issue about that. Tell them what you said. Oh, good. Uh, not, yeah, yeah, but nobody, yeah. not a lot of people. No, it's a problem. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you guys are very blessed to have you JJ. Yeah. She's seen it all. So. Burring. Yeah. Situations and yeah. stuff out there. So. Us outsiders have no idea that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. I know. We don't have anything like that where we are. No, and I don't. I, I mean, I, but I'm. I'm not. Even in this area. area. <laughs> no, that's why I enjoyed Atlantic because I thought those little crosses in Cape Coral were all like grave sites. So more blacks in it. More owls. I mean, there's owls there. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's not a lot of, not a lot of. Yeah. Yeah, great site. And they were really little people. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like roadside before, like the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Um, so closing. So um, 
you know, these are very important things. We know these mortgage note deeds and other documents you are signing closing are extremely complex legal documents. Very complex. Like mortgages between 12 and 16 pages. Um, I don't go through every page of the mortgage, but I pull out the most important stuff. Like you can't lapse on your insurance on the property. If the lender finds out you did that for typically longer than 90 days, you'll get a notice saying that they accelerated the loan. You need to pay the entire loan off in 30 days. Like those are things that are in these mortgages. And, you know, a lot of first time home buyers, they're just excited. Oh, I just want to start painting the house. And then they just fly through these things without, you know, really sitting down and understanding exactly what they're required to do based on mortgage note deeds. We know about those, uh, you know, how to, how we're going to, take title, how we're going to protect ourselves and our family if something were to happen. Um, this one, I kind of like, forget what you were told by anyone before going to closing. What counts is what's the documents say. Yeah, and that can't be further from the truth. I mean, you know, people buying or selling, I'm sure all their friends and uncles or whatever are telling them how they did it when they, you know, know you need to do it like this, like that, whatever. Most of the people don't even live in the state of Florida. They have no idea what Florida real estate laws are, but they want to provide their friend all the advice in the world. Like, that's not good. That's what, that's what we are here for as real estate professionals is to make sure that they know what the document's saying. Like, my worst fear would be a buyer writing a review about our business or coming back to our business or telling one of you guys that when they left my office after signing 150 pages for the next 30 years of their life, that they didn't know what they were signing. Like, that's not cool to me. Like, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, the Apple terms and agreement. So, like, we do for our first time home buyers, you know, our closing is probably an hour and a half, you know, and, but I think that that's very fair and valuable time for them because at, I know what these documents are. That's my job. So, I like explaining them to people as boring as it may be. They need to know why they're signing this, what this means, what happens if they default. Like these are all very important things for them to grasp because like if they defaulted, let's say the insurance, for example, right? They didn't know that if insurance lapsed or whatever, I don't want them to ever be able to call me and say, well, you never told me that how serious this was. You know, we had fun and we took pictures and the signing was great, but you never told me that if I didn't do this, I didn't perform this way that the lender could send me a letter that says, all 300,000 is due in 30, 30 days. Um, so we do a very, very, very in-depth job with our buyers and sellers explaining exactly why they're signing this, what it means, and what the good and the bad could be from it. Uh, and that's why I write here, have someone who is extremely familiar with these documents and closing procedures to cover you. Um, I would love to, like I said in the beginning, if anybody wants to sit in, uh, on a on a loan package signing, and you, maybe you, you you haven't had a full one yet with a buyer, or you have one. Like, I want you guys to know the documents too, because a lot of times at closing tables, the buyer is going to trust you way more than me, because this might be the first time they ever see me in person, right? I'm just sending emails and asking them to send money, so the trust is not like the 30 days that you got probably longer, you know, four months that you guys are taking up to a showing every other day. Like they trust you, and I, I would never want one of you got them to ask you guys about something, and then maybe you couldn't answer it for them. Like I want you to be extremely educated in exactly what the documents are, because the lenders don't come to closings. So yes, it's all the lenders' documents, 150 pages, but one in a hundred probably come and sit with their borrower and actually explain them. So we're we're explaining it to them, or you guys are the closing, and you're helping walk through them too. So if anyone ever wants to do that with me, I can print out like an old one and we can go through it or you can come to the office and sit with me i'm open to any of those things or sit with uh, my wife jen she's really good at um the documents as well and then this kind of like this kind of goes with like knowing an expert right um these are just common things that people hear throughout the transaction that maybe uh they heard incorrectly people like to hear what they want to hear um or like I said, somebody that's not involved like we are is in their ear telling them why I'm wrong or you're wrong or whatever. And these are just some of the, the um, key ones that, that can really blow up in people's faces if it's not, if it's not laid out very, very, very precisely. 
like they said there's no prepayment penalty. They said that the interest rate is going to be this or that the interest rate is fixed. Or I can quit claim the property into a corporation after closing. Um, you know, it's not too late for a 1031 <laughs> transaction. Yeah, like, you know, my company is only liable for the mortgage or I don't have to live in the property. Like this one right here is one of the biggest mortgage frauds because you buy a property. That's why they have a... Um, um, shoot, what's it called? A residence disclosure that says primary residence, second home, investment, whatever. And people will buy them as their primary residence because they can get an interest rate for 4% versus if it was a rental property, the interest, rate, the interest rate's 9%. They're signing with the notary that they live there full time. And in a week, they're renting it out. That's a no-no. The lender catches wind of that. They're going to get that letter that says, we want our money now, all of it now, you know? Um, so these are things that I just off the top of my head because I see these and I always point these out every time I say, here's your interest rate. If it's an arm, here's your interest rate after 10. Um, it says very in the first payment letter, it'll say no prepayment penalty. Like those are the main things I show to, to the borrowers so they know. I explain to them, you know, you can pay your mortgage payment and then half a principal and it's going to knock down. Your, you know, I try to. I'm on their side, you know, like the consumer is my number one priority in, in these transactions, um, offering them the best service. And then <clears throat> these obviously are more for like a, an actual accountant. But these are some of the things um, that people need to go over for investment properties for your investors. 1031 tax deferred. Um, we do 1031s. We've probably done 15 in the last year from both being the seller where I'm um, sending it to the intermediary and then or um a buyer is buying it through a 1031 exchange so we're versed on handling it either way 1031 exchange through my office though we actually partner with a company called old republic exchange she's extremely good very quick not not very expensive um we are FERPA certified but not 1031 i stay away from the irs i like the people that are really good at that handle it but one thing i don't do though is I will be the middleman between the exchanger and, and the company, um, and I don't charge an extra processing fee or anything like that. You know, they're just paying the exchanger and we're sitting there um, getting all the documents to them. They send their money to Old Republic Exchange. They have a certain amount of time to buy another property. A lot of them have the property picked out before they've sold their initial investment, and then they just wire the funds in and purchase the, the other one. Um, capital gains versus ordinary income on your homesteaded property. Um, so if somebody, we had one where a husband and wife sold their house in Cape Coral, they net 570,000. So he was asked, he wanted to do a 1031 exchange. That's not possible on homesteaded property. Not possible at all, but he wanted, he thought it was, and I had to explain no. Luckily though, as a married couple, homesteaded property, first 500,000, and then the 70 left is what he had to pay capital gains on. Not bad, not a bad day to make over half a million dollars and only pay tax on 70 of it. So, but he was upset about that part too. I'm like, oh, you just never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Most people will be left. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, depreciation. Exactly. Yeah. That's $500,000. Yep. Depreciation recapture. You guys know how to work with your investors on that. And obviously, please, please consult a real CPA before you sell or buy. Um, and then this just kind of goes through most of the class. Let's get it right from the beginning. The terms are very clear for both parties. Everybody's happy. Everybody knows we're moving in this direction. Yes, there can be some changes to it, but like Joanna was saying, like we don't want to go under contract just to go under contract and then add all these things to it. Like that, that's not the way to do it because that's nobody's going to be happy with that. And then we have litigation and people are upset and you know, all those things. Let's get it, let's get it done right the first time if we need to add a repair addendum or a credit addendum, that's easy. Um, and then don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, when you're structuring your real estate portfolio, it can be scary, but very rewarding. Find like-minded people partners to bounce ideas off of. I think that's very important. Um, you know, if you want to start working with investors as a realtor, um, but you haven't worked with a, with a real, real investor, let me know because I have some agents that love to talk about why they're successful. You know, like 
I found that most people that are really good at something they do, they want to tell other people about, you know, not just to kind of brag about themselves, but they're proud of what they accomplish. And I have people that would be willing to sit down and talk to you guys about, you know, foreign, foreign owners and FERPA and all that actual agents, not just me. Uh, and then investment property is now protected by Homestead, of course. Can't have it both ways. Uh, then this one is just limit the liability. You know, your insurance is the only first line of defense. Are you really covered and what are your limits? Um, exposure to tenants, guests, and others. Property management is a very good idea for your investors. Um, that's what they do. They, they protect you. You know, who gets sued when they sue the owner? How a properly drafted lease can help protect you. That's big. Daniel can help create leases for you guys. I know you guys probably do, do it already, but um, very good with that. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's the best way to go. Like when you're dealing with an investor and he's just saying, well, I don't want to pay the fees every month. Trust me, the fees that he's going to have to pay if he does it improperly are way more than his monthly fee that he'd pay a property manager. Right now, our situation is my mother-in-law rented out her back um, garage with a tenant. Now they're squatting and, and like the owners have no rights when it comes to that stuff. It's, it's just insane to me. Um, I've been trying to fight it and I just, I can't get anywhere. And it's just, then we figured out that this woman has done it other multiple times before. You know, but my mother in law didn't want to talk to me about the lease and didn't want me involved with interviewing people and all those type of things. So, you know, now I got to clean it up. But, but you know, when you work with investors, talk them into using the property management. They, they, can, they can be playing golf in Ohio and everyone's handling what they need to handle down here. Um, uh, pitfalls of personal involvement. That's like when you have tenants and become really close with them. Um, be, you know, be nice to people, but it is a business relationship and business transaction every time. That's one problem with my mother-in-law is she's so open and nice. She'll have them over for dinner and then all these sob stories. And next thing you know, they haven't paid rent in two months, you know, and that's, you know, I, I, I love people too, but if you're renting from me, there's a strict line between, you know, our, our relationships together. Uh, and then the last one, I think, how to take type. Um, so <laughs> if you guys want to look at this sheet really quick, we'll just go through the four that are up here, joint tenants. And these, this is a class I did. If you want to see the full class, I think it's on YouTube and on the website. Uh, I did this one like a month and a half ago. And these are just the most common ways to take title. This is what we see 95% of the time. So um, Joint tenants with right of survivorship. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so any number of uh, individuals can hold title under joint ownership as tenants in common with the share of the property, depending on the person's contributions. Sorry, that's not this one, but that one has to do with how much money you're putting in uh, compared to how much you owe it. Like if you guys start partnering with other realtors to be an investor, that's a good one for that. Um, two or more who are not married to each other. Um, joint tenancy with rights or survivorship. This is the type of ownership. All joint ten tenants have equal rights to their share in the property. In addition, due to the right of survivorship, which is not present for tenants in common, a joint tenant dies, his or her, her share is automatically distributed among the remaining joint tenants. There are no restrictions under the number of persons that can be joint tenants under joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Um, tenants by the entireties. This option is available only to married couples and allows the couple to hold title in the name of both spouses. Both the husband and wife have equal possession rights of the property. When one dies, his or her share is automatically distributed to the surviving spouse. That's why, like, when you guys see buyer information sheets, um, you know, and your buyer calls and they're like, why are they asking me what my, um, you know, what my, if I'm single or married? That's why, because the deed is very, you know, you say Brent Wood, um, Brent and Jennifer Wood, a married couple, right? Putting that language on there, if something happens to me, no probate, nothing like that. It goes immediately to my wife and vice versa. Um, 
And then like for tenancy by the entirety, you know, there are certain advantages that protects the asset um, from a creditor pursuing a judgment. You guys know that. Um, it offers control over how the property is disposed of, you know, obviously when, when people pass or whatever. Um, and, but it does require both parties to sign a deed transferring any interest in the property for homestead loans. Uh, and then you have down here, which for investors, um, that's that's what I would highly, highly suggest if it was me, is, is ownership through an entity. Um, and I'll just touch base on that really quick. Rather than own a property as people, owners may choose to require it through a separate legal entity, such as a corporation or LLC. Corporations and LLC companies can have a number of shareholders or members, but rights to the property of individual shareholders or members will be limited to the face value of the shares or membership interest that each person holds. That's also called an operating agreement. So when I have an LLC that's selling a property, I ask immediately for the operating agreement so that I can see who can convey title. Right. We wouldn't want a receptionist to start selling property without the owner of the company knowing. So if you guys go into LLCs with people, completely cool, fine, but make sure you have very clear terms of, on who does what and, and what powers each one have. Uh, a lot of people, I'm, it's weird to me, a lot of LLCs, when I ask them for the operating agreement, they don't even have one. That's something that Daniel can help or you guys can do yourselves. Just you know, who's, who has the power, who can sign uh, legal documents on behalf of the LLC, and then how many people have to sign. Like in LLCs, they probably two or three, four people signing the deeds, because like I said, you don't want somebody to be able to all that power and kind of, you know, do it behind people's back, whatever it may be. Um, but this one, I like this one. You can also do, yeah, I'm sure you guys have seen it. You can do a different LLC for every property, different trust for every property. I like that one, like for me personally, um, for investing the LLC, because you can do um, one, two, three, ABC street LLC. It's very easy to show the P and L and then it's easier for me to be able to provide any uh, deductions. Uh, yes. Um, so let's say we're writing terms for investors and say you're inside here. So it's a good idea to put this property in the LLC. Yeah. Uh, can we send them to the LLC and then you can get your attorney and yeah. you guys can make the quick claim? Quick claim mm -hmm. LLC. Completely fine. And yeah. What would that cost to be? Like, uh, so when we do, yeah, when we do quick claims, I only charge 125. Like an attorney is probably going to be 500. I'm not. I'm not a really a greedy person. And honestly, it's one document, like draft it, notarize it, record it, we're done. So it's not something that we have to create all this urgency before uh -uh. we close. You have to get this done and we can always handle it after closing. Yeah, yeah. The only, close. the one, the one downside to that would be a quick claim deed, like I was saying before everyone came, is the weakest link in title. So it doesn't provide any warranties. And a warranty deed, obviously the seller is giving a warranty on the title. Now, if you're doing it in between, correct. If it's the same person, cool. But I've had people that are like, um, call our office to do a, a quick claim deed, but not a sale because they're like, we're just gonna sell it outside of having to play co closing costs. I'll pay this guy 5,000. I just want it quick claim, but do not ever do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, it's not a good way. Yeah. The only time it's okay, in my opinion, would be if it's going from you to you or to a, an immediate family member, wife, child. That's it. Why they're allowed to sell these things at Office Depot? I don't know. I go and say I have all kinds of contracts for real estate. Right. That's why we're going over this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've only had one in the last year, but yeah, it's just, you know, Bob and Bill, a married couple. Usually, um, instead of saying like a man or a man, it's just married couple, you know. But if you were to buy like Brentwood, a single man, and Crystal Keck, a single woman, if we were to buy a property and we were both legally single. Um, but yeah. Yeah. That's just, yeah. That's correct. Rip, very good question. Yeah, but like I, I, I think it's the exact same as any married I mean, couple. Married, so yeah. Same yeah. Yep. Yeah. So other than that, I think we've touched a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, and, and like I said, I, I'm I'm very, very accessible. Um, I I love to talk about this kind of stuff and I love to to help educate you guys as much as I can. Um, I always joke around, I say title insurance is boring. Why not work with somebody who's not? And we try to make it as fun as it can be, but it's it, it, title insurance and title work is, is a lot of reading, a lot of paperwork, but I like to tell people about it because I feel like not only are you guys amazing realtors, but if you can learn every aspect of it, lending, like in-depth lending as well, I think that just separates you. Because the last thing we ever want is for a buyer or seller to ask you a question and y'all not be able to answer it right off the top. So if anyone ever wants to meet, I'd love to do coffee, lunch. You can come by my office. Like I said, it's a mile away. So uh, we're there every day. And thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you. Yeah.